Good morning, church, and welcome to worship. It's great to have you with us this fine Sunday morning. Uh, we're glad to be able to share this time with you today, whether you're joining us in person or online. Uh, my name is Ryan Jensen, and I'm one of the pastors here at Oak Hill, and uh, my wife, Missy, uh, Pastor Missy and I, and um, Louise Avant and our musicians will be leading you in worship today. If you're joining us in person, hopefully you found on your way in um, a bulletin, and inside of that, a white attendance card. Uh, we would certainly appreciate it if you would fill that out for us. Let us know that you're here. And while you're at it, there is an opportunity at the bottom to uh, write down any prayer concerns that you might have that you'd like us to pray over for you. Um, and then later in the service, uh, during our offertory, you can place those in one of our baskets as those are passed. Uh, if you're worshiping with us online this morning, we'd love to hear from you too. Uh, you can let us know that you're joining us uh, by saying hello in the chat. Um, and if you have any prayer concerns, you can note those in the chat as well, and we'd be glad to lift those up for you and add those to our prayer list. Uh, for families with young children, we also want to let you know that we have our playground over here to the left in our sanctuary, um, where your kids can play quietly while they participate in worship with the rest of us. And I believe that covers all the who's and what's uh, of the morning. So once again, welcome. And I invite you now to stand as you're able as we center ourselves and enter into a time of worship. Let us join together in our call to worship. We are gathered to worship our God. Send your spirit upon us. We come from many places with many burdens. Send your spirit upon us. We turn our hearts to you, O God. Send your spirit upon us and make us your beloved family. If you'd please remain standing, we're now going to sing together, Great is the Lord. Words will be found on the screen or on page 2022 in the Faith We Sing hymnal.
You may be seated. Let us go to God in prayer together this morning. Holy and loving God, we are so grateful to be gathered together in your presence this day. Oh God, on our church calendar, it's a day for us to celebrate and remember the baptism of Jesus. That day when Jesus entered the waters at the River Jordan. And when he emerged, Lord, we hear the scriptures say the heavens opened and your Holy Spirit descended like a dove. And the words were spoken, this is my son, my beloved. With him I am well pleased. O oh God, you make that same claim on each one of us. We are each your child. We are each chosen, beloved, and forgiven. But God, our world, when we look around, it doesn't seem that way. It doesn't feel that way. When we look around, we see brokenness. We feel the pain of broken relationships, violence, war-torn countries. And sometimes it's hard for us to remember who we are in light of who you are. So God, help us to reclaim our identities in you. And oh God, may your spirit fall afresh upon us today so that we might be your servants, willing to work to make change in our world. Help us to find ways to love our neighbors, the ones we like and even the ones we don't. <laughs> Oh God, as this new year begins, we pray for new leaders that are taking on positions, whether that's in politics or in communities or in our churches. We pray that they might come from a position of servant leadership and that you would fill them with your grace and wisdom as they lead. We pray for our teachers and students as they begin a new semester. Keep them safe. Help them to be filled with the desire to learn and grow. Oh God, we lift up those who are on our prayer list today. We pray for Chris, Emily, Jeannie, D, David, Bob, Fran, Joy, Levon, Margaret, Poppy, Carol, Chris, Janet, William, Carrie, Barbara, Baby Colt, Pop, Patty, Martha, Ernie. We pray especially for Mike and Connie Trujillo who are grieving the death of their son Aaron. And we also lift up others who are also mourning the loss of loved ones. And we pray for peace in our own lives and throughout the world. God, there are others that are on our hearts that only you are aware of. Yet you know them, whether they're spoken or shared or kept to ourselves. God, you know us completely. 
So we place all these persons and situations into your loving care. And we pray that you would encourage us to be the people in their lives that remind them that they are known and loved and forgiven. Oh God, we join our voices now and we pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite our children to come forward now for our children's time with Miss Carla. Hey guys, come on up. I see some beautiful crowns that we made in Sunday school. Okay. I know you guys know what this is. This is a star. And like we just talked about in Sunday school, the star pointed the way for the wise men to find Jesus, right? I'm going to take us on a little tiny tour of where we can find Jesus today. Can you stand up with me? Okay. So, if the star pointed the wise men to Jesus, I'm going to take us where we can find Jesus in this church. Okay? Can you guys follow me? Okay. So, whenever Pastor Missy, Pastor Ryan, Pastor Stephen talk to us and preach from this pulpit and tell us about Jesus, the Bible, what that means for us, that's where we can be pointed to Jesus, right? Okay, let's come over here. What table is this? What do we use this table for? Communion, where we have the bread and the juice. This is where, and the sun shines right there this time of day, <laughs> right in your eyes. So communion reminds us that we're all accepted and loved by Jesus, right? And over here, when we hear beautiful songs that the choir, Miss Louise, leads us in, we can experience Jesus that way. Is that it? This is my favorite way that I find Jesus, follow me, is right here in our community. The Bible says where two or three are gathered, two or three people that love Jesus, that's where we can find him. I know for me, times when I've been really sad <laughs> or really overwhelmed, this community specifically has just come around us, me and my family, and just loved us. And I have known that God loves me during those times, okay? So even though we're in the new year, we've got ways that we can be shown right to God, okay? All right, will you guys pray with me? Let's stand right here, okay? Dear, dear God, thank you for this day. And thank you for all the ways we are shown right to you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys can go back to your seat. Thanks for coming up. As they're finding their way back to their seats, I invite our ushers to come forward. As we take this time to offer our gifts to God, we remember that our money that we give to the church doesn't just keep the lights on and the air condition flowing, although that's a very good thing and helps me feel closer to God. I don't know about you, but... It's also a way that we say yes to God. It's a way for us to say we want to partner with you in ministry. 
We know that by ourselves that we cannot change the world, but together as a church across the world, we can change one life at a time. And together we are better. And we're even stronger when God blesses those gifts and uses them for God's purposes. So we encourage you to think of how you might generously respond to God, to be a part of the work that God is doing in our world. We have three different ways to give here at Oak Hill. You can place your gift in the basket as it is passed along with your attendance and prayer cards. You can place those or you can uh, text to give. The number is here on the screen, or you can go to our website to give as well. So let's pray and ask God's blessing. God, you are so good, for you are the one that sustains our life and provides for our needs. So God, out of our abundance, we give a portion back to you. And in our giving, we are saying we trust you, that there will still be enough. In placing our gifts, we are committing ourselves to be at work in the world with you, knowing that together we are so much stronger, that we are so much more effective in spreading your love and helping others to know that they too are known and chosen and beloved. Oh God, receive these gifts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. Please bow your heads for the prayer for illumination. Eternal God, your message to us has always been that our relationship to you is inseparable from how we relate to others in the world. Send your Holy Spirit upon us to teach us the powerful message of your redeeming grace. Remind us again, O oh God, how to live through trust, faithful commitment, and love. Amen. This morning's scripture reading is from Isaiah 42. Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out, or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching the islands will put their hope. This is what God the Lord says. The creator of the heavens, who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the nations, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield glory to another, nor my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place, and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. It's a rough world out there these days. Maybe it's always been this way, and I'm just starting to see it more clearly. But it feels much different than what I remember from my youth. I know I lived a sheltered life growing up, remaining naive to the struggles of others outside of my social circle, not seeing the poverty that existed in other communities just a ways across town, oblivious to the violence and fears that some were forced to deal with on a daily basis in their neighborhoods, schools, or even in their own homes, unaware of the prejudices that still existed among people of different races that perpetuated systemic injustices, and hearing about but not really processing what went into the fight to preserve our freedoms in different wars that seemed to go on forever. I know I lived in an insulated bubble with blinders that were put there to protect me, but even as my field of vision grew and my expanding social circles began to reveal more of the world, even with turning over a new leaf and starting to watch the news, even still, I don't remember things being quite the way they were back then as they are today. Maybe my level of awareness just continues to grow. I've realized that parenthood does that now that I'm the one trying to insulate my own children from the ugliness and the dangers of the world. And we are more connected to one another than we have ever been before because of the internet and social media at least enough so that information travels further and faster, if not so much in the depth of our relationships. But whether what I see in the world today is just because of a growing perspective or due to actual shifts that have taken place over the last 20 or so years, the fact remains that we live in a rough world. Division seems as prevalent as the stars in the sky Little things set people apart, and a growing number of people seem to feel the need to voice every negative thought 
and critique that they have on their social media platform of choice. Mistrust is everywhere. An underlying suspicion of people and institutions seems to be the norm, as people feel manipulated by misinformation, subjected to malintentions, or stepped on by those who are only concerned with gathering or maintaining power and position. Violence plagues our communities and our schools. We can't seem to go a week without hearing about another school shooting or someone running their car into a crowd of people. Mental health seems to be in a much more precarious state for so many following the pandemic. Stories of human rights violations, war, food shortages, and a global energy crisis fill the news. And as soon as we think that we have a handle on one problem, three more seem to take its place. At the risk of sounding like Chicken Little, the world seems to be falling to pieces around us. But as messed up as it seems at times, the feeling we might have of the world as we know it crumbling around us is not unique to our circumstances. The prophet Isaiah, the writer of our scripture passage today, found himself called by God to lead the Israelites through some pretty tough circumstances of their own back in the day. In fact, as he's writing this particular section of his work, the stuff has really hit the fan. The southern kingdom of Judah had recently fallen to the Babylonians, and by this time, the northern kingdom of Israel was gone too, having been conquered by the Assyrians 135 years prior. The Jewish people were devastated. They were fractured. The Babylonians had carried off part of those in the southern kingdom into exile, while another part was left behind in their homeland to try to pick up the pieces after armies and raiders and vandals had plundered the land, leaving residents with little to work with. The Israelites had been demoralized by their defeat and cut off from the traditions of their faith. It was not a pretty picture. Definitely not the kind of circumstances where one would be excited about stepping in as God's spokesperson at a time when it would be difficult to recognize where God was at work in the middle of all their human failings. As, as dire as that situation was, however, God made it clear that he wasn't done with the people and brings them a message of hope through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I uphold, he says, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands wait for his teaching. Right in the middle of their mess and the confusion of the day, Isaiah shares of God's servant, who's charged with bringing justice and teaching to the nations. And if God's at work through this servant, then that means that God hasn't completely washed his hands of the situation and left them to figure out their own mess. But then who is this servant? Well, Isaiah doesn't really say. But he's likely referring to the nation of Israel itself. And by doing so, he's reminding them that they are God's chosen people. And regardless of where they find themselves now, that claim on their identity hasn't changed. They've been set apart to set at, and set to task with a purpose. God has entrusted them with a mission of revealing God to the nations of the world through his teachings and with establishing justice in the earth. And until that mission is complete, they will endure and they will not be crushed. God will continue to uphold them. In other words, their story is far from over. God's Spirit still rests upon them. God will still advocate for them, and they remain God's covenant people. 
But is there more to this prophecy? I mean, it's great that God continued to be with the Israelites through their mess back then. But what about ours? Where is God? And how is God at work now? While Israel, while Israel did pr- prove to be a light to the nations, opening others' eyes to God's justice and teaching, the reach of Isaiah's prophecy would stretch well beyond the Babylonian exile. In fact, the crazy thing about Isaiah's prophecy is that it would also help to reveal the true nature of Jesus, the Messiah, almost 600 years later. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the liturgical calendar, today is Baptism of the Lord Sunday. And on this day, we remember and celebrate the day Jesus waded into the waters of the Jordan River to be baptized by John and thus begin his ministry. What does that have to do with Isaiah, you ask? Well, do you remember what happened as Jesus came up from the water? In Matthew chapter 3, we read that suddenly the heavens were opened to him and he saw God's Spirit descending on him like a dove and alighting on him. And a, and a voice from the heavens said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Does that sound familiar? It's not all that different from what we hear in Isaiah of God's servant when God says, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. In fact, as Jesus moves on from here, we also see him living into the calling of the servant. He himself becomes God's light to the nations through his teachings revealing God's truth and opening the eyes of the blind, both literally and physically, figuratively. On top of that, he establishes God's justice in the earth by bringing out from prison those who sit in darkness as he overcomes sin and death on the cross once and for all. This is where we find our good news. Because what God did through Jesus the Christ opened the door for all to experience God's same justice and freedom, the same gifting of the Spirit, the same welcome and chosenness among God's people. So in the midst of our mess and brokenness, we know that God is still present and still advocating for us too. But lest you think that this is the entirety of the scope of Isaiah's prophecy, And hear this, not only do these words here encompass the Israelites, or even Jesus himself, as Christ followers who have been baptized into the death and resurrection of Jesus, having been invested with the Holy Spirit, we have also been grafted into this mission, this purpose that God places upon his chosen servant. As Christ followers, we have been empowered and equipped, and we now share in the responsibility of this end goal of establishing justice and sharing Christ's teachings that eyes might be opened and prisoners set free. As Matthew 5, 14 and 16 says, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. We are a part of what God is doing in the world around us. We are instruments of God's justice. We are a part of this. But here is where God is doing a new thing. Here is where our expectations have to be reimagined to fit the parameters of God's plan so that God's vision can be realized and we can help right the wrongs and undo the mess of our own making. The justice that God has in mind, however, takes shape differently and requires a paradigm shift in our understanding of the role of a leader. Where we have come to assume that realizing change requires being the loudest and the most forceful, the most charismatic and uncompromising, the strongest and least vulnerable, 
a leadership that God envisions for his servant is one of humility and patience, nonviolence and mercy, gentleness and persistence. Isaiah writes, he will not cry out or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. And a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. So it's not a matter of who organizes the biggest and loudest protests or who can be the most intimidating at the ballot box or who can throw around the most money or social media influence, who presents themselves the best, or anything like that. That's not the leadership that God is looking for. Instead, it's about truly seeing and being present with the weak and vulnerable, and patiently pursuing change. It's about gently restoring a sense of sinner to a demoralized people so that they might experience God's mercy and justice. That is the role of God's chosen in establishing justice in the world. That is our role, our purpose as Christ followers. And that is how we help to transform this broken, messed up world back into the goodness that God intended for it. That is the hope that God brings us in the words of Isaiah. God is not done with us, not yet. And we have the chance to help be the change that we so desperately want to see. Amen. As we respond to God's word, I want to invite you to stand as you're able, and we're going to sing uh, the first and third verses of Wade in the Water and if this is um, a day that you would like to become a, an official part of this congregation, we invite you to come see Pastor Missy or myself um, while we sing or after the service, and we'd be glad to welcome you into this family of faith.
as we close our service today, we remember that that call has been placed on our lives to wade in, to go deeper in our faith. And so we invite you to consider the ways that you would like to get connected. This next Sunday, we are starting our next grief share group. That's a grief support group that will meet on Sunday afternoons from 2 to 4. Um, and that is open to the public. So if it's for you, a neighbor, a friend, a loved one that is grieving the loss of someone they love, they are welcome to join us for Grief Share beginning next Sunday. We also have many small groups starting as we begin this new year. So we invite you to look at different Sunday school classes that are open to all ages, as well as some new studies that are starting. Um, I'll be doing Disciple uh, New Testament this semester that starts next week. Um, and there's a Wednesday morning group as well and many other things to look into. So we hope that you'll find a place to, to plug in. And then finally, we have uh, the listening room coming up on January 20th. That's a Friday evening. And Del Castillo will be here performing in our sanctuary. Again, that's open to the public, so we hope you will uh, invite your friends to come and enjoy some, some good music here at church. Well, as we conclude, we want to remind you today of the baptismal waters that you have entered into. And if you haven't done so yet, here's a preview of what's coming. But together, I invite you to join me in our responsive benediction. Every day we journey on this earth is a day in which we make choices. Left or right, up or down, in or out, yes or no. Some choices are simple and some are very complex, but one choice informs all the others. Who will be our God? Who will we trust to see us through this journey? Who will you choose? Will you choose this day to stay faithful to the one who is faithful to us? Count us in. Will you choose this day to place your whole trust in the one who is trustworthy? Count us in. Will you choose this day to commit your talents and your resources to the one who first endowed them. Count us in. Will you choose this day to love the one who loved us first? Count us in. Let us commit ourselves to the Lord as we pray together. We devote ourselves to you by renewing the covenant, the promise you made to humanity so long ago. Because you are our God, we will be your people, enlarge our faithfulness, our trust, our commitment, and our love, so that we may graciously uphold our side of the deal. Help us always to recognize your presence and your blessings throughout our journey. Keep us in your care. Amen. Friends. Know that you are chosen, you are beloved, you are forgiven, and God is counting on you to be God's servant in the world. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.